I wonder, has it been a month before the pandemic? Maybe a few years, maybe before a first smartphone. I've seen the slide so many times now, but I still can't recall when my last time was away from a screen for a day. I'm looking at one right now. What about you? Hi everyone, I'm Chirag and I work at Adaptivist. Today I'm here to talk to you about the impact of screen time on our health with some findings that I've come across online, some techniques to help cope with the different challenges we face digitally and hopefully leave you with an understanding of the consequences of not doing anything. I am fortunate to work in a company that was always ready for a remote only workforce as the company itself was born in that manner. Now with over 400 employees, we're all finding ways to constantly adapt to the demands and needs of modern remote work. The global COVID-19 pandemic transformed the world of work in an instant, with many businesses forced to adapt dramatically overnight. This speedy switch to digital has seen a sharp increase in video conferencing and a big drop in the number of people commuting to the office. That means more flexible working hours for many and more time to sleep, spend with family and do some exercise. Sounds good, right? Not quite. There are some obvious downsides too. We are all looking at our screens more than ever before. And we are always on with constant notifications bombarding us about what's going on while we're trying to focus or eat our dinner. Research shows that digital connectivity is shortening our attention span, impacting our memory and causing anxiety, none of which is great for doing our jobs or for our well-being. And it got us thinking, how conscious are people of their digital health? What does it even mean? Do you know how much your screen time is impacting your motivation, relationships and well-being? To find out, Adaptivist surveyed 2,800 people about how they found transitioning to fully remote working in 2020, and the results were surprising. In this talk, we explore some of the findings and take a look at useful techniques to keep your digital health on track, from communicating better and decluttering our digital lives to keeping context switching to a minimum and combating an always-on culture. First up, let's take a look at how we communicate online. How many times have you done this in front of your screen when you receive what appears to be a not-so-friendly message from a colleague? If you're like over half of the workers we surveyed who thought that company-wide communication had improved in the wake of the first lockdown, then you might be enjoying remote working more than you expected. But for many people, communicating with colleagues remotely causes anxiety, with 38% admitting to worry about it at least once a day. So why does this happen? Why do people miscommunicate things or get things taken in the wrong way? You see, words only play a small part of how we communicate. Tone and voice and body language are far more important. With only 7% of successful communication relying on the specific words we choose, if we don't have our cameras on during video conferencing, a shocking 55% of our message might not be getting across. And if you're just using an instant messaging app, then even more of the meaning might be lost. The rise of emojis and emoticons has helped instant message become more flexible and may increase the percentage of communication accuracy. But it's still nowhere close to being face to face, right? It's a recipe for disaster in the workplace. Our survey showed that this acute lack of clarity means a large number of people have been seriously offended, mis misinterpreted a colleague's tone had to apologize to someone else or received an apology because of a communication misstep with younger employees finding it the hardest. As you can see from the results of this question, 
There have been several cases of people feeling offended due to something that was communicated or more likely miscommunicated. I think we can all probably relate to this happening to every one of us in the last 12 months. It's hard enough making sure your message gets across face to face sometimes, let alone doing it remotely for 100% of the time to anybody you interact with. So how do we fix it? What can we do to help make this better? Here are five things you can try. The first one, always ask yourself, if I was saying this face to face, how would I say it? And then how do I convey this best digitally? Once you know the answer, you can decide which platform works best for your message. Next, if you're connecting with someone new, try and avoid short messages without any context, especially via instant messenger. Remember, they don't know you yet or your tone, so meaning could get lost in digitization. The third thing to remember is that good manners and personal attention go a long way. It might sound obvious and you'll be really surprised, but don't forget to ask people how they're doing or smile when you're greeting colleagues on a video call. It makes a big difference. And don't be offended if people don't reply to messages straight away. If it's urgent, try a video chat or phone call. Likewise, if you can't get back to someone straight away, let them know you're tied up if it's going to take you a while to reply. Finally, we know video can be tedious, but in team calls, try to keep yours on. It helps create a feeling of togetherness. If you need a break, just let people know so they don't think you're being rude. Now that we've talked about communication etiquette, let's move on to talk about the digital hoarding that we all do. You may think you've cracked the communication etiquette, but do you ever feel overwhelmed by all the apps, folders, and files cluttering up your digital world? Are you a digital hoarder? What is digital hoarding? Digital hoarding is the accumulation of digital files to the point of loss of perspective, which eventually results in stress and disorganization. Even mild hoarding can make you feel overwhelmed by a computer. If your hoarding tendencies are slowing you down, causing you stress, or making it harder to get the job done, it might be worth addressing the issue before it gets out of hand. Okay, enough of the talking. Let's show you an example of what digital hoarding looks like. Does this look familiar? If yes, then you are a digital hoarder. This isn't just limited to your desktop, by the way. You can be hoarding apps and files on your phone too. I always relate it back to reality. How would you feel if you walked into a room full of unorganized junk? It takes its toll on us just looking at it physically and the same applies in the digital world. Okay, we've seen an example of what digital hoarding looks like and how that can make us feel, hopefully bad. How does this make you feel? I look at this and find it peaceful to look at. Although I have a colleague who'd still say to me, Chirag, those are far too many icons on the dock. Seriously, her desktop is the cleanest I've ever come across. Now, the ones who are really paying attention will have noticed that Google Chrome is open in this desktop. Let's have a peek and see what it says. Ah, so hoarding also applies to your browser tabs. This is something I'm guilty of to this day. So there are a number of obvious problems caused by stockpiling data. First, you might be wasting a lot of time that could be better used for something else. Did you know that workers spend 45 minutes a day searching for information between different platforms? Second is a security concern that arises from not knowing where all your data is stored and if it's adequately protected. This might not impact you directly, but it could be hugely detrimental to your company. Third, 
The worry of losing vital documents could be causing you some serious underlying stress. This could be impacting your health in the long term. And fourth, whilst the cloud might seem infinite, but the more you save, the bigger the servers are required to store all that data for all of us. And that's one big carbon footprint for the planet, which is perhaps a topic for another time if we still have it. I mentioned this in the previous slide and I think it deserves a bit more limelight. 45 minutes per day, that's nearly four hours in a working week. And that's just one worker. What about your whole team, department, company? That's a lot of mental maths I know to do on the spot, but more importantly, that's a lot of wasted time. 45 minutes is a decent time to get a workout or get some fresh air or attend to something or unplug. So how can you tackle hoarding for good? Here are four key strategies I'd recommend for staying on top of all that virtual stuff. I'd start off by giving your desktop a detox, scheduling a regular slot each week to organize files into clearly labeled folders. And don't forget to empty your trash. Make sure your dock is free from unused apps so you can find what you need in an instant. Number two, give your inbox a long, hard stare. And I mean a long, hard stare. If you've got hundreds of old unread emails and you have no plans on opening, delete them. And delete actioned emails you have no further use for as well. File away action emails that you want to keep into clearly labeled folders so you can find them in the future and find them quickly. And set up filters so that new emails can automatically move into those uh, specific folders too. Step three is to take care of your tabs. Delete the browser tabs at the end of each day that you're done with and pin the most important one. Review your pinned tabs regularly to call any you no longer need. If you use Google Chrome, try using something called Session Buddy. It lets you save different tabs as collections, making it really easy to find everything um, if your system crashes or if you wanna go back to a, 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 a saved state. The fourth strategy is to implement a monthly audit of your photos, downloads, and any other data. Ask yourself if you really need to hang on to everything. Again, it's a bit like in real life in the physical room. Sometimes you hold on to things that are sentimental but are really of no use to you. And sometimes it's just about letting go. You can make it more fun by listening to some music or your favorite podcast whilst you're doing it. So it doesn't feel more like a chore. We now move into the third digital challenge, context switching. Can anyone relate to this particular meme? If you've made it this far without looking away, checking your email or scrolling through your phone, then you're probably in the minority. Studies show people generally lose concentration after just eight seconds, eight seconds. You're probably multitasking as you're watching this talk and I've just got your attention again as I said that. At work, it's even harder to focus with constant interruptions pulling our attention in different directions every eight minutes. And getting back on track takes time too. This infuriating multitasking is called context switching. And lots of us are faced with it every day as we move rapidly between different tasks without completing them. It's made worse by remote working too, where the problem is compounded by even more virtual communication more stress, frustration, and reduced productivity can all result from too much switching. Luckily, there are some things you can do to alleviate the pressure and increase your concentration. But let's take a step away from your computer for a minute. Our smartphones have become our soulmates almost. We do life with it by our side. We spend a minimum of three hours looking at our phones every day on average. No fast mental math this time, but if you're picking up your phone 60 times a day, are you ever getting back on track? 
the reality is that we probably aren't. In fact, just see the number of times we pick up our phone and how long for. The majority of it is for less than two minutes. A quarter of the time is for less than five minutes. And only a mere 5% of the time are we actually using the phone for longer than 10 minutes. Here are five steps that you could take to help manage. The first one, figure out how responsive you need to be. Could you check your emails twice a day or even once? Second, break tasks down into manageable chunks that you can fit in between response times. And feel free to mix personal and professional. This is about planning your day and both worlds are important. Third, schedule those tasks in your calendar for a clear plan. Fourth, keep others in the loop to manage expectations about when you respond. And fifth, keep assessing what works to improve your system as you go. Remember, you're not going to get this right first time and that's completely okay. When you know how to switch with care, you need to make the most of that precious focus time. Try out one or all of the following things to retrain your brain and boost your concentration levels. If you enjoy puzzles, spending just 15 minutes a day has been shown to significantly improve concentration. Whatever you're doing, when you feel like quitting, tell yourself to do five more. That might be five more minutes, five more email responses, or five more slides for a presentation. Or you could just read for pleasure, leave your phone in a different room, however, and try and read without stopping for 30 minutes. You might find it hard at first, but soon you'll get the hang of it and hopefully you won't want to put that book down. Another proven technique for time management is the Pomodoro technique. This is how it's done. Choose a task you want to complete, then set a timer for 25 minutes. Start working, and when the timer rings, make a check mark in a piece of paper and take a short break, about three to five minutes. When you have four check marks, take a longer break. Reset your check mark count to zero and start again. Hopefully you understand the importance of maintaining focus and context switching to a minimum. We're now entering part four. In a world where we are never bored, it's important to practice the art of doing nothing too. Letting your mind wander without any distractions is how you can problem solve effectively and be more creative. To be more bored, you could try strolling around your neighborhood if it's safe to do so, or sitting in the park without looking at your phone or listening to music. Being more bored is essentially spending time without technology. If you're sick of the rings, dings, and desktop alerts constantly interrupting your trail of thought, you are not alone. This always-on culture has become the new norm. Sure, being connected has a number of benefits, but what about the drawbacks? These are some headlines from well-known news and publication outlets highlighting the impact screen time is having on us. It's no surprise that the last 12 months has seen a rapid increase in the number of hours we spend looking at a screen. But I don't think we actually realize its true effects on us. And I don't think some of us will until something gives way. I thought I'd share with you what my own personal screen time has been like in the past few decades and how the pandemic has impacted me. As you can probably tell, I came to realize this was an issue for me not that long ago. In fact, I'd probably say perhaps six months ago is when it really hit me as I was trying to focus on a task at work, but my mind kept wandering and I kept getting distracted. I'd randomly open a new window and start surfing YouTube or the news, or I'd look at my notifications on Slack every few minutes. Or I try to review my team's work and then get lost again. It was driving me crazy and it became a big issue for me but I've made some changes that have really helped me and I hope that they can help you too. Not switching off is detrimental to our health. It increases stress, interferes with life at home and makes it much harder for us to focus when we need to. The survey showed that one in four people find it hard to switch off at the end of the day 
because they're either tempted to keep working or other people expect them to be contactable outside of typical office hours. So what's the alternative? Some workplaces have dedicated times of the day when everyone focuses on communication. So the rest is freed up for other tasks. Could this work for you and your team? In France, companies with more than 50 employees have set out hours when staff shouldn't send or respond to emails. If your company is not cooperative, there are some things you can do as an individual to make a real difference too. Start by switching off notifications on your desktop and close your email browser when you're focusing. Set boundaries by making everyone aware of your office hours in your email footer and set up automatic replies for outside of these hours. Really important this one, put your phone on silent and face down or leave it in another room altogether. Don't be on when you are off. So if you're taking a holiday or if you're off sick, fight the urge to check in. You can set status on communication platforms to in a meeting or out to lunch when you're busy so people don't expect you to reply. You can also do something such as focus hours so people know you're focusing. Some of these listed might be items you've tried already. Find something that you haven't tried yet and make it part of your test next week. Part of making new habits is preparing your environment to enable it to happen. So try to do something the night before that helps you the next day. Even if it's something as small as putting your yoga mat on the floor ready for next morning. Talking of yoga mats, one of the biggest things that has helped me keep sane and regain my focus is meditation. Last year when lockdown kicked in, I attended virtual meditation classes regularly and I haven't looked back since. I now meditate every morning before starting my day for about 10 to 15 minutes and the benefits have been amazing. I feel like I can really focus on the task at hand now. I can listen attentively and I'm able to manage my stress much better. Some of you may be familiar with meditating. Some have tried but haven't quite got the hang of it, like I did at first. But like with everything else in life, regular practice can help. Okay, now I've been talking to you all for the best part of 20 minutes, and I hope you trust me enough to try some meditation with me. I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine yourself in your happy place, whatever that is. For some, it might be in the beach or surrounded by nature, or resting on your loved one's lap. Whatever your happy place is, really picture yourself there and think of all the details. What does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does your breath feel like? How does it sound like? Now, as you think about this, take in a small, long inhale, really capturing all the goodness from your happy place as you do, away from all your worries. Now hold your breath and bring to forefront all the issues that are troubling you today, however big or small. Bring them to your forefront, but don't go into the details, just have them be there. And slowly release your breath through your mouth and imagine all of those issues going away as you do so. Make it as long and slow breath as you can and slowly resume back your breath back to normal. And open your eyes, of course. Now, how did that feel? Hopefully it did some good. We all get hung up on our day to day that we don't have time to take care of ourselves. Could this be something you could try to fit into your life? Being aware of your digital health is really important from communicating effectively with colleagues and managing digital hoarding to taking control of context switching and knowing when to turn devices off for some downtime. There are lots of useful tools out there to support you and your colleagues as you navigate the new normal of working remotely. And our survey showed that many businesses are taking the opportunity to improve the way they communicate. And lots of people are really enjoying working from home. But remember, good communication isn't relentless communication. We all need to learn to balance video meetings with important problem solving and creative tasks keep context switching to a minimum and avoid blurring the lines between our work and personal life. Only then will we be happy, motivated and focused enough to do a really good job. As we come towards an end, you all may be wondering, Chirag, 
yeah, this is helpful, but there are so many things to remember here. Where do I even start? And I'd probably leave you with these three things. Start to be more aware of what you're doing, of what you're saying or not saying. Try to be more present in today than worrying about what happened yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow. I know it's hard at first, but once you get into the habit, it will really come into its own. And finally, it's okay to be bored sometimes. Make time for time without technology. Connect with nature or yourself. Meditation can help with all of these, but you have to try and do what works best for you. We are all different, but it's up to you to find your own inner peace. And my message to you all today is to try. The future you might thank you, but I want to thank you so much for your time today. And I truly hope you found this talk useful. I'd love to connect with you all later. So please feel free to reach out to me. I also want to thank Atlassian for giving me this opportunity to speak at this year's Team 2021 event. And I want to say thank you to my employer Adaptivist for allowing me to use their survey as part of the talk. If you're struggling to know how to stay digitally healthy and want to know more, feel free to check out the Digital Etiquette Report for lots more useful advice. Thank you once again and stay safe.